so many problems that you have as an adult because of trauma when you were a kid started as a means of survival. And this is one of the most incredible and beautiful things about human beings that when we didn't have the love and safety we needed, some part of our spirit rose up and created that love and safety as if by magic. So that's the origin of what we call magical thinking on this channel, the power to manufacture reality. In this video from about a year ago that I'm about to share with you, I respond to a letter from someone who is stuck in the magic. And when I published it, there was an outpouring of identification. So for those of you who haven't seen all the videos from back then, I'm sharing with you now my video called Lost Love and Magical Thinking. Now, magical thinking is usually considered a bad thing, but getting PTSD during childhood and going into magical thinking and getting really good at it may just have saved you from having your spirit destroyed. And I want to tell you why I say that. So when bad things were happening and a parent hurt you or abandoned you or told you you were worthless, your little child's mind you know, if you had stayed present and lucid in those moments, you would have had to absorb that blow. You would have had to take it in. And it's so unthinkably painful that it, it could have shattered you emotionally and psychologically. And I mean, what parent even says these kind of things? I've heard them do it. It happens. But who would abandon a kid? Who would physically hurt them? So as a kid, you couldn't take that in. Your mind did something incredibly brilliant and separated you and shut down the feelings and hardened that little tender part of you that could perceive reality, that was tuned into the nuance of what everything means and where people are coming from. And it put those parts of you in a safe place, in quasi unconsciousness. And that's how you dealt with experiences that could otherwise have hurt you even more. So checking out, thank goodness, that we were able to do that so that there's an intact little spirit in there now and we have the good fortune to bring this part of ourselves back into the world. It's not always obvious how to do that and when we make an effort it can be clunky and inconsistent and then we keep slipping back sometimes into that checked out mode and when we do that as adults people can hurt us and we get confused instead of angry and we cling instead of running away but we can keep trying to keep coming back up out of ourselves and, and follow that road to healing. That is what it's like. So today I have a letter from a woman I'll call Olivia and she is right there like healing, but sliding back into that little place. That's unfortunately for her right now, pretty negative, but she can't totally see it yet. So I'm going to read her letter out loud and then see if I can help her open her eyes and get unstuck and take one good strong leap forward in her healing. And here's what Olivia says. Dear fairy, according to your quiz, I score a hundred percent in CPTSD symptoms, as does my mother. I don't know anything about my father. I've never even seen a photo of him. My mom was an abused child. She was beaten, abandoned, and sexually abused. She was a heroin addict when she got pregnant with me in her early twenties. And my father was a party fling. She decided to go ahead with the pregnancy with me. Long story short, she did give up on drugs when she decided to keep me. And I do believe she did the best she could given what little she had to work with. Nevertheless, she was not present or fully capable of raising children. I have a younger sister. She says we were extremely neglected to the point of our basic needs not being met. And I have little memory of any physical affection. We also moved often and struggled financially, which created a general lack of stability. She was a single mom putting herself through school and working, which left very little time for us. When we were five and seven, my sister and I were up before her and riding the city bus to school alone without anyone to prepare breakfast or pack a lunch. We often stole candy from 7-Eleven to feed ourselves. I could go on with the many layers of dysfunction in our family, but I think you probably have a sense that it simply was not healthy or safe for a child. All right. I got the picture. It's coming together now. So that's some background. And Olivia says, now I'm in my forties, barely scraping by financially and have yet to experience a true, healthy, stable, and loving relationship. I live with a friend who also happens to be someone I obsessively fell for a few years back when we first knew each other. 
I became convinced through intense dream and meditation experiences that we were soulmates and mystically bonded. I had no idea I was just one of his many booty calls. He was good looking, troubled, bad boy archetype, and I was living in a fantasy world, thinking that he must feel it too. I can't deny that there have been some very bizarre synchronicities, but this person flat out rejected me to my face and I kept hanging on to a sliver of hope that one day it would all change. He would see and love me and we'd live out our fairy tale destiny. Over the past year, we have established a very different platonic dynamic. Though I still feel anxious at times and feelings do resurface, mainly sadness associated with the feeling of being unwanted and rejection and being on my own. I quit hooking up with him when I set a standard that I would not be sexually involved with anyone who didn't actually choose me, see me, and love me. And needless to say, I've been celibate ever since. I'm renting a room in his house at a very affordable rate because he helped me out of a situation where I had nowhere to go. I'm working diligently on building a business and he's supportive in that. He also understands what it's like not to have family to back you up and I believe wants to be there for me in that way. We now play as if we're more like siblings who help each other like family. He refers to me as his sister. He also had a really rough upbringing and is focused on healing. I'm well aware of how messy this all probably sounds, but our relationship continues to improve. I feel that he's been a really tough teacher and mirror for me to see where I'm not well, especially in terms of codependency and extreme people pleasing in his case. My female friend actually told me that it was looking like Stockholm Syndrome, given the way that this guy was treating me. I'm doing all I can to shed light on that and change the behavior. The main reason I bring all of this up is that despite the positive shift in our dynamic, me accepting that he's not the one, I'm circling a lot. I must look like a, like a mean teacher here, but I'm gonna go over this again and I just wanna make sure we talk about some of these key phrases you're using. So accepting that he's not the one for me, though when he's particularly sweet, says Olivia, and he's now more than he ever was, these flickers of future faking, do resurface until I talk myself out of it. I have an underlying fear that my dynamic with him may be blocking me from meeting someone who would be right for me. He now has a great girlfriend who's helping him heal and grow, which I would think would help clear the space even more. But I'm basically looking for some perspective from someone who understands CPTSD. I'm happy with my living situation and I care for him deeply. I'm just curious if maybe I'm not catching a blind spot and would love your input. Thank you for taking the time to read this. I'm very grateful. Olivia, I think when you wrote to me, I, I, you, you've seen enough of my videos to probably guess where I'm gonna come from on this, okay? I think that you are in some serious magical thinking. And I'm noticing some phrases here that tend to come from new age types of disciplines and communities. And you may have seen, I have a video, I'll link it at the end of this one, about ways that new age myths can be used to manipulate people. And I think that while you're kind of being manipulated here, most of all, you're deceiving yourself, all right? Tough love, but let's go through your letter and I'll tell you why I say that. Okay, first I heard your background. I, I don't think anybody who was abandoned at that level, who, whose mom was a heroin addict, who had to get themselves out on the city bus and eat it and steal candy at 7-Eleven <laughs> when they're five, uh, that's just, you know, I totally understand. I understand as few others can actually what that can do to you and how it can distort your perception of what it means to love somebody or be a friend or be a brother and sister, all right? So you're in your 40s and you haven't yet had a truly healthy, stable and loving relationship. And I think that, you know, you had told me a little more that I didn't read here, but you've been working really hard on yourself. You tend to be a hermit. Um, some people are really, truly introverted, but a lot of people are hermits because it's triggering to be around people. And so I'm going to guess that whatever your personality is like, people are triggering for you and you crave a safe space where you know who it is you know who you're living with, and you, you can feel kind of safe and taken care of. 
being in your 40s and not being financially on your feet, you know, it happens to the best of us, right? But I'm hearing here that this could be sort of a setup for you to be extremely vulnerable and dependent on somebody who is feeding off of your energy, your romantic energy being in that presence. So I'm just going to go through some areas that I circled one by one and not just jump to what it is I'm about here. Let's build up to this. Okay. You became convinced through intense dream and meditation experiences that you were soulmates and mystically bonded. It's called limerence. And that is something really common for people with childhood trauma, especially people who were abandoned. And limerence is this thing that's something like being in love. But what's strange about it is it involves a whole bunch of obsession. You'll find yourself like just trying to read into every little thing that the other person says or does. There's a huge element of fantasy there. And you know, especially if you're kind of involved in, in um, spiritual new age type stuff, there's going to be some validation for this that, oh yes, your fantasy about this has some, has some reality to it. But with CPTSD, not all fantasies have reality to it. You can have a vision of what you want for your life, but when you keep imagining that somebody is your special somebody, but they have a girlfriend, they don't want to be with you, then it's a, it's a toxic drug that in effect, even though you don't want to be, you're taking a drug to try to numb out what's horrible. And the trouble with limerent relationships is they almost, they, they very, very rarely can evolve into something like neutral and safe. So I'll get to that. All right. So soulmates and mystically bonded. Um, this may really upset a lot of people listening, but I think if you have CPTSD and attachment issues, I would just get rid of the whole idea of soulmates. It's, it's not a helpful concept. And it's a, it's a phrase, it's a figure of speech that people use. The, it also goes along with um, the idea of twin flames. And if I had a dollar for every time people had written to me about um, how they used to believe in twin flames, which is like where you, you believe that you're the same soul as somebody, uh, it's just not true. I'm just going to call it. It's not true. It's, um, it's a form of fantasy and it can be used to manipulate people. Uh, it's a way of convincing people that even though a relationship is just totally awful and you don't get what you want and you, maybe you're a side thing or a, um, a source, um, a source of energy or romantic validation for somebody, that it all means something. It's a way that people get hooked in to bad relationships. So that's why I'm just calling it. All right. So then in your letter, you said, I can't deny there have been some bizarre synchronicities. Okay. So when you, there's a couple things you say here where I can tell you're not platonic. You're still in it. The magical thinking is there, but you're fighting it. You're sort of like, I'm trying to accept that we're just friends and I'm living in his house and he has a girlfriend, but there are these bizarre synchronicities. Later in the letter, you say, uh, I'm trying to accept that he's not the one for me, but when he's particularly sweet and he is now more than ever, these flickers of future faking do resurface until I talk myself out of it. So I think you mean you future fake yourself. And for anybody watching, future faking is when somebody manipulates another person by saying, it's going to be so great, baby, we're going to get married. And they do this like when you barely know them. And if you're very vulnerable, you go along with it and believe it. And future faking, I'd say that when people say, you know what, I think that we're soulmates or we had a past life together. That is, you know, that is a form of future faking. It's, it, it's sort of trying to trick somebody into thinking there's something there, but there's no intention to follow up on it. They may occasionally think they intend to follow up on it, but future faking is it's um, connected to a lot of narcissistic behavior and manipulative behavior where somebody is just trying to get what they want. So you know that word, but if you were applying it to him, I, I don't know if he's future faking. I think you, you might be future faking yourself is what I'm saying. Okay. So then you kind of, you say that, uh, there are bizarre synchronicities, but, and here you come back to reality, this person flat out rejected me to my face and I kept hanging on to a sliver of hope that one day it would all change. He would see and love me and we'd live out our fairy tale destiny. All right. So when you say fairy tale, I know you're being ironic and you're being silly, but I know what limerence is like, and it is a fairy tale. <laughs> That is what's going on. It's a pretend story and it's a fantasy. It's a form of escapism. So 
you know, trauma reactions, it's like fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And when you go into fantasy, it's a form of flight. You're escaping. Reality is too hard and too painful. And there's these little reminders that something's terribly wrong and change is going to be required and change is scary. And so it's just like, whoosh, I'm just going into this fantasy because really, you know, this is going to work out. There's, there is no writing on the wall that this is going to work out at all. All right. So I, I'll just be the mean old fairy who tells you that it, um, this is not going to work out. But right now, you guys kind of have an agreement that you get to stay there and fawn on him, you know, think that he's really special and great and helping you. There's a lot of language of helping here. Um, you did say it's almost impossible to be yourself around him because you're so nervous. And that is, um, that's just one more sign like that this is not like a good relationship. A good relationship, for, whether it's platonic or romantic, means you can be yourself with somebody. You're not afraid to be yourself. But you know what happens, Olivia? It, what we do is we stop being ourselves because being ourselves would make it all too painfully obvious that this is like, it's like a cat walking on the piano keys, right? It's just, it's not, something is really discordant. It's not working. There's no harmony here. And so you're cramming this belief system in that somehow it's okay. Well, you know what we call it around here. We call it crap fit. And that's what we do when we got so good as, at, as kids at fitting ourselves to crap. Now, I bet when you were at 7-Eleven stealing candy with your sister, I bet you guys were so good at looking like good little innocent girls, right? <laughs> And you were good little innocent girls. I mean, kids got to eat, right? <laughs> you were good. But I bet you learned to start putting out an exterior version of yourself for other people to see while you get in there and was like stealing, you know, candy. And uh, having grown up kind of poor and neglected myself, I just know there's a lot of shame involved. It's a lot of shame. And a person can get a very strong need to sort of cover it up. And, and when you get so good at that, when you get so good at covering up your shame, that's crap fit. And if you don't heal that, see, that's a beautiful adaptation to cope with being a little kid and not having food. In your 40s, becoming dependent on somebody where you can't be yourself and pretending that there's like some sort of magic to the whole thing, that is the same thing. It's, it's, it's the same survival technique, only now it's not helping you survive. It's sabotaging your ability to survive. Like this is a fragile situation. And for you, a, a wonderful next step in your life would be to heal from your trauma. And to heal from trauma, most of the time, we really need to be like in kind of a peaceful, safe space where we're not getting triggered all the time. So then you say, over the past year, we've established a very different platonic dynamic. Um, and I'm just gonna say, I think he's established a platonic dynamic um, or a, a, a platonic boundary, the dynamic sounds like it's still very much romantic. Though I still feel anxious at times and feelings resurface, mainly sadness associated with feeling unwanted, rejection, and being on my own. Oh, I mean, I know I don't need to tell you this, but you see the parallel of where you were as a child, and now there you are again, rejected, abandoned, on your own, and trying to hold on. Olivia, you're stealing candy right now. That's really what's going on. You're not getting food and uh, you're stealing candy. And you describe here, you feel sad. You say, I quit hooking up with him when I set a standard that I would not be sexually involved with anyone who didn't actually choose me and see me and love me. So I'm proud of you for doing that, to stop having sex with him, but you had to set the standard. Like he says, I don't have feelings for you. I'm flat out rejecting you, but I will keep having sex. I'm taking a lot of letters about this recently because I want to talk really strongly on your behalf and say, so long as you are entangled in relationships like this, it won't be enough to not have sex. If you're living there, if you're sad all the time, if you're abandoned all the time, it's like you have a, you know, a wound, right? And you just keep like scraping it off. The scab is off and it's bleeding again and again and again every time it hurts you. How are you going to heal with that going on, right? But I get you, I think you're scared. I think you're really, really scared that you can't make it. So you said, I'm renting a room in his house at a very affordable rate because he helped me out of a situation where I had nowhere to go. So, you know, 
<laughs> you wouldn't be the first person who had to live in a difficult situation because you had nowhere to go. But this has been going on a year and you're saying that you're working on building a business and he's supportive. Um, I'm going to suggest something like that sort of flat is maybe more advice than you want, but building a business to get out of there sounds like a recipe for vagueness and that for the short term, getting a job is what would get you out of there. Getting a job is what would get you out of there. And it's possible to build your business while you have a job. I did. I built up my business as a single mom and uh, it takes a lot of energy and focus, but you can do that. A job would bring in immediate income and not have to, you know, bring some business to fruition. He also understands what it's like not to have a family to back you up. And I believe he wants to be there for me in that way. He's not a family. Him saying that and him being there like a sister, that's not a family. Okay. This is not your family. This is a guy you used to have sex with who'd like to still be having sex with you. Who's having sex with somebody else who doesn't love you. And so I know your family of origin was, a, was, was very much like that where you were not loved, but I want you to have that. If you want to stop having the suffering right now, you're going to need to make a conscious decision to stop having these crap fit relationships. It's so hard. I know, I know because it means walking away from the only family, you know, right now, it feels like the only thing there will ever be. And I know that you've been through a lot and that could feel really destabilizing. So there might be a period of transition coming up and I'll talk about that. One really big red flag I saw here. Um, you're saying the relationship is improving. And what I'm hearing is that you're getting better and better at stuffing and hiding how you really feel about it and how hurt you are and how much this is paralyzing you moving forward in your life with being able to actually find a real relationship or get on your feet financially. And you say, I feel that he's been a really tough teacher and mirror for me to see where I'm not well, especially in terms of codependency and extreme people pleasing in this case. Those words teacher and mirror for a, a, for a manipulative and sad relationship. That's where I was like, this is you're into some new age stuff, I think, right? Cause that's a, that's a hallmark of it, a tough teacher and mirror. And those are put forth towards people who are being manipulated as a justification for saying, sure, this makes you feel humiliated and empty and sad and unable to function, but I'm your teacher. I'm a tough teacher. This is not teaching you anything. It's sucking the soul out of you. Okay. I'm just going to say it really strongly because you wrote to me and you know what I'm like, right? I care very much about you. I relate to you too. Um, and a mirror, the mirror to show you where you're not well. Well, have you seen enough, Olivia? I'm just going to say that with, with great directness. Have you seen enough? You're not well. You have codependence and extreme people pleasing. All right. You're fawning. That's a trauma reaction. And you're sacrificing any opportunity to care for yourself and take care of your own life and be fulfilled and heal yourself to try to make it feel okay for him to do whatever he's doing. Your friend says it looks like Stockholm syndrome. I'm with your friend. <laughs> it looks like Stockholm syndrome. I don't think he's abusing you directly. I think he is a selfish person who is saying what he wants and you're agreeing to it. So in his mind, there's no problem here. And we get letters all the time where, you know, one party says, you know, I don't want a relationship. And the other person says, well, I can put up with that for now, but it could be a relationship in the future. Right. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, maybe, mm hmm, mm hmm. Well, I think that's morally wrong. We can, we can, the, the manipulative person can, we can tell ourselves that we got consent and it's mutual, but it's not. We're taking advantage of someone who needs love so bad. They will say anything to keep us from leaving. So that's what I have to say about him. And then you say, um, so you're accepting that he's not the one for you. Although you still keep getting this idea that he, these flickers, right? And I'm just telling you, so long as you're in this guy's presence, you're going to see flickers. He's somebody you were attracted to, to begin with. He's somebody who has no compunction at all about having somebody he was sleeping with, would sleep with now and a new girlfriend all in the same space. Like that works for him. And maybe it works for his new girlfriend. I don't know. Maybe this is actually really horrible for her too. And you might want to consider that as well, but I don't know. She is helping him heal and grow. Ah. Oh, so he's really good at getting women to help him and heal him and help him grow. This is starting to make me mad 
because you had said he's a tough teacher to show you that you're codependent and extreme people pleasing. So healthy adults, they don't heal each other. Okay, that's there's there are rare instances I think where a broken person ends up uh, with a with a very profound friendship with somebody who ends up being um, a, a spouse, and there was some sort of like assistance with healing there that could happen, but but that's not what's happening here. He's not healing and growing. He is just he's having a great time. That's all. But he's pray that when you tell a person who's vulnerable and codependent that they are healing you and helping you grow, that's how you give them their fuel to keep them around. And so a lot of what I'm guessing this is, is it's kind of like a narcissist codependent dance here where the narcissist gets that, you know, adoring energy and the codependent gets to feel like they're healing and growing or having a tough teacher, a mirror. And all of it is completely destructive to your life. So just calling it out. All right. I'm calling it out. So you say, I have an underlying fear that my dynamic with him may be blocking me from meeting someone who would be right for you. So Olivia, here's the thing I want you to like really like take in here. If you were to meet the person who's right for you, they would not want to be with you because your energy and your heart are just so entangled with this guy. He's like, he's running the show here. So a healthy person does not want to get involved with somebody who has that kind of confusion and entanglement. You know what they want? They want someone who takes care of themselves. They want someone who has self-respect and who wouldn't dream of trying to help and heal or have a tough teacher that causes them pain, but who takes positive steps on their own behalf. That's how healthy people behave. That's what they're looking for until we heal or at any stage of our healing, the relationships that we end up with are, are usually a reflection of where we are ourselves. And so right now you're in something that's a little more like a transactional relationship. You know, I'll give you this if you give me that. So he gives you security. You give him the, you know, adoring energy that he wants. And that's transactional. That's not right. It's not, that's not love. And I get it. He's your friend and he's, you know, encouraging and supportive, but I'm just saying you can do so much better. You can do like 20 times better, but you're going to need to heal first. I don't think that you're going to go out of the frying pan and into a wonderful relationship. There's like this fire that you have to walk through first. And so jumping into a relationship from here would be very likely to have a similar dynamic or something just as, just as unpleasant and destructive for you. And you know, I don't think we have like nine lives on this. Maybe we have nine, but we don't have 20. And so the, every time that we get completely spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, functionally, financially invested in somebody and the whole thing falls apart, it's like something gets torn off of us and we can't totally heal that. And we walk into the next thing with some wounds from that. And if this happens again and again and again, um, I've heard it called like a piece of cardboard where, you know, cardboard gets glued together and you pull them apart and it's, and the, and the outer layer of the cardboard gets torn off every time. And soon you just have this like flimsy kind of piece of brown paper with holes in it and chunks of glue. <laughs> That's what it feels like, right? So the object of the game here is to stop bonding with these, you know, lousy, with these pieces of cardboard, stop bonding, start to heal yourself. And, you know, I think one of the problems is that everybody says that, but nobody knows how to do it. I know how to do it. That's what I'm teaching here. I do know how to heal. I can teach you what I did. All right. If you ever want, go check out all my courses or my membership. That's what we do here. We get real with each other. We use tools that help to come out of the, the bad dream of what we think we have to put up with and all the anger and all the grief that drives us into trauma driven lives and decisions. Okay. So um, those courses are down below in the description section. So you were thinking that he has this girlfriend and that would help clear the space even more. So I see what you mean that sometimes when you are pining away for somebody, when they're with somebody else, it kind of helps you face up to the reality. But in your case, it's not. You're still pining away. I don't think you're at a place where you can deeply consider other people's feelings, but, but for reference, Hanging on to this guy with all your romantic energy for him when some other woman is in a relationship with him is undermining to her. If you were to accept that you're not with him 
and just let them experience whatever relationship they were going to have, uh, it would probably be better for everybody. And I'm going to guess, you know, it's not going to work out for anybody probably, but I don't know. You know, I can't, I don't have eyes for the future, but I know for you that hanging around that relationship is not clearing a space. And even that, those words, clearing a space, just remind me of that new age manipulation. It's like, it's okay, you know, he can bring her in. It's not like crowding the house. It's clearing a space, right? I just think it's BS. I'm mad at him for you. And I want to help you face this and, and get out. Okay. But, all right. So I'm looking for some perspective for someone who understands CPTSD. So there you have it, Olivia. That's my tough love. So here's, here's what I would suggest to you, if you can handle it, is take a period of time, um, because I'm guessing that it would be very destabilizing for you to move on and you don't have the money right now. But let's say three months, three months to go get a job, start saving up some money and get ready to have enough money to get a deposit on your own place to live, maybe with housemates. And um, for people with CPTSD and especially for you as a hermit, I realize housemates might be tough. So maybe a studio apartment, something very small, you know, what they call in England a bed sit. It only needs to be small at first because when you heal your personal ability to direct your life and do things like get a better job, they just, it just starts getting easier and easier. And one thing about, <laughs> about being single is you, it, it pushes you out of the house. So some things that you might want to do is get yourself out there to things that don't cost money that connect you with people who are also interested in healing. And I'm going to suggest 12 step communities. Um, it's, there's no money involved. You know, you can donate a, a little bit of money if you want, but there's no money involved. There's no authority and there's nobody who can come in and romantically take advantage of you. Um, and in exchange for some kind of position or advancement in the organization. And I, that's not to say that vulnerable people don't have flings. But for you right now, celibate would not just mean not having sex, but not getting emotionally connected and entangled with a man right now. So you know who that leaves? Women. And if you're like a lot of us who had tough mothers <laughs> and who tend to be attracted to manipulative men, you may not have great relationships with women. And I would just say, just let that be your number one priority. Women friends in 12-step meetings. Uh, there's some, everybody qualifies for one or another. And one thing for you, you definitely qualify for Al-Anon. That was my safe space when I first needed somewhere to go to get away from all the toxic stuff I was involved with. And it was fantastic. And I met wonderful people who are working hard on themselves or who needed support. And I was able to, you know, be somebody who could listen to somebody else and support them and ask how they were doing. That was a growth experience for me. That was a mirror. It was not a tough teacher. It was a pleasant, lovely, warm bath with roses in it of a teacher. How about that? Right? <laughs> Get that kind of teacher. And, you know, there's, I think right now, as I'm recording this, there's, there's not always infinite in-person meetings to go to. I don't think that limerence is always an addiction. I think that that's, it's a close enough description of what it is. When we have childhood PTSD, there's stuff going on there that are like wounds, like psychological wounds. But for practical purposes, you might as well teach it as an addiction. So there's also programs for people who have love addiction, uh, where you can also get support for separating. And I just, I just encourage you to stay out of environments that are really conducive to you getting to feed off your energy from validation and um, kind of fatherliness from men. If it's genuinely fatherliness, not somebody where there's any kind of attraction, that, that could be kind of a nice thing for you to be around. And find the people who are safe for you. And safe people are people who are not seeking a romantic or sexual relationship with you. And they're people who want the best for you, right? So one thing about being in the meetings is that you can get a second opinion from your newfound friends when you go looking for a job. And the t there's a type of job that people who have this kind of vulnerability are very vulnerable to, and that's to, to go work for yet another, um, usually man, who wants to suck that adoring energy. It doesn't, you know, it may not be a romantic type of thing, but who wants to suck that adoring energy out of you in return for, um, you know, a pretty low wage. <laughs> And because of your experience, people pleasing and codependence, you would be obliged to accept that. You would sort of get back right into that same mind F that you are living in right now. 
So basically any job can get screwed up through exploitative relationships and entanglements. And that is one of the attractions of self-employment. And I know that that's a goal for you. And you can set out that goal and you can begin that on a small scale. But just to get money coming in right away, I would recommend a really straightforward job where you do something that needs to be done. At the end of the day, you clock out. And it's never about some complicated dynamic with a boss or you know, appearing with them at parties or or listening to their problems or anything like that, like a super clean, straightforward job. And something that comes to mind is stocking shelves in a grocery store, editing video. That may not be a skill you have, but that's a skill that I developed and I loved it because it's a service <laughs> that you can do without getting any kind of entanglement with people. You can pass things over online. But online jobs, the one limitation is you're not gonna be around people. And one way or another, I'm gonna encourage you to have a balance of being with people and having some time to rest and recover as a person who feels inclined to be a hermit. You wanna be with people and you wanna rest and recover. I have a lot of courses that help with the relationship part, the calming your triggers part, and the connecting with other people. So if you're interested, definitely check those out. They're always beneath the videos, but you can keep coming back here while you're saving money, watch these videos for free and go take my free course, The Daily Practice. It helps calm symptoms. And people who take that course are invited to come to free Zoom calls with me twice a month where we use the techniques together and I take questions. Maybe I'll meet you there. I would love that. If those of you watching this video feel like a lot of this stuff is resonating with you, I've put a couple of quizzes down below that can help you identify where CPTSD may be affecting you today in your relationships and your connection with people. And if you like this topic, I've got a video lined up that's very relevant to what we talked about before. It's called New Age Myths That Keep You Single. And I've got it right here. It's a doozy. And I will see you very soon.